All right, my friends, you beautiful people out there in the world, wherever you are, you conscious mofos, you educated people, you, 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 you people who want to learn more, people who want to be conscious even more. I got a guy on the channel. I had a talk with him yesterday. I was extremely impressed. He impressed me in five minutes, my friends. PhD dude wrote the dissertation and all that. Heavyweight guy. He, he's a professor at Ole Miss. Uh, can you imagine the circumstances in which he do what he do at Ole Miss? Oh my God. That's not what he's gonna talk about. He's gonna share some knowledge with you. I'm Anthony Brogdon. You know who I am. You've been watching me. You know strong inspirations where we give it to you straight, no chasing. I had a lime, a lemon, some ice cubes, but I make sure you get it and it knocks you out. Where you understand something new. Thank you for watching. A lot of good things is happening on the channel. My numbers is up. People are ordering my book. I'm excited that more people are understanding this good Black history that I try to provide you, my friends. I got a few things I'm going to go fast. My man is busy. He hopping. He moving. He grooving. One, I got this festival in Quindaro, Kansas. I want you to come down. I need a thousand of y'all to meet me May 27th through the 29th in Quindaro, which is a suburb or really a part of Kansas City, Kansas. I got a video on the channel where I interview a guy whose great grandfather walked across the Missouri River to get his freedom when it froze. And then he told that man, don't come over here looking for me because I'm shooting back. Don't come over here looking for me in Quindaro. You got to watch that one. I'm having a toy drive in Quindaro to introduce the festival May 4th. I'm jamming my peoples. I'm having a festival in Elaine, Arkansas. Did you hear about that massacre that they killed almost 300 people and they standing in the fields? All cause they was tired of being taken advantage of? Watch that video. I'm jamming on this channel, my friends. Hit the subscribe button, it's free. I don't ask no information. All I ask is that you subscribe. It kind of really, I ain't gonna lie to you between me and you, it lets you know you like me. You like what I'm doing. Hit the like button on this video. Watch, you're gonna like it a lot. Hit the notifications bell. So when I and I'm putting four or five videos up a day, I just released one before this show. Just release. I, I do, I put them up and I'm jamming. And then tell somebody about strong inspiration. Don't be keeping this to yourself, acting like you know everything and don't want nobody to know where you got it from. Don't do that. That's an injustice. All right. And uh, to do this, uh, my friends, uh, watch my movie. I'm a filmmaker. I'm serious about my game. Business in the Black. It came out in 2017. And when it did, I took it with my own money to 40 cities around the country. I was showing it where I was like Johnny Appleseed, spruing out this knowledge. It's on Amazon. It's, and I'm putting it on Tubi and them other digital services so you can watch it and then read my book. I really want you to read. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm so confident in the book. You read my book and you don't learn nothing new. I give your money back. Have you ever heard a book with a money back guarantee? Boom, there it is. I ain't even gonna ask no questions. I send your money back. And every 10th book I sell, I donate one to a school. People need to know this because I didn't know it. I don't know what happened. Maybe I was sleeping that class when they told me about slaves who own businesses. Don't know what happened. But when I, when I, when I found out by happenstance, I look up and say, man, I got to share this. Boom, there it is. Get my book. Go to my website, businessintheblack.net. Go there right now. Hit the subscribe button right now. Now, you know, you hear me use this word strong a lot. That's my favorite word, man. I've been using strong for a long time. Somebody said, hey, man, you need to have you a brand word that people can recognize you by. I came up with the word strong. Boom, just like that. And it's, it goes for everything I do. 
And in my world, strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace, which is the introduction to my guest today. He's a strong man, strong soul, brother. Come on, man, introduce yourself. Let's get it on. Thank you for coming on the channel. And I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I've looked at a couple of your videos and uh, you really got it. You really got it going on. Uh, I'm Chuck Ross. Uh, like Brother Anthony said, I'm a professor at the University of Mississippi. I teach uh, African-American history. My specialty is 20th century African-American history, uh, really sport history. I've written two books. One book looks at African-American football players in the National Football League, pro football from 1904 to 1962. And then my second book looks at black players in the American Football League from 1960 to 1970. So it's uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be on yeah. this show because I've okay, been checking you out. You got you got a lot of knowledge that you've been dropping and oh, yeah. uh, I yeah. really like what, I like what you're doing. I mean, I appreciate it. And so before we get started, I want to talk about you, my brother, man. How you, where you from? Uh, I was actually born in Gary, Indiana, but I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, about okay. three hours south of you there in Detroit. Uh, I graduated, I, I, I came out of uh, high school there in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I went to Stillman College, historically black school down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, I had a great uh, experience there. How, how did you get there? How, who told you about the school? Well, my parents went there. My parents were from uh, okay. Alabama. My father was from Bessemer, which is right outside of Birmingham. My mother was from a little small town called Aliceville, which is uh, right. Um, across the Mississippi line in Alabama. They went to Stillman. Uh, they graduated from Stillman in the 1950s. I graduated from Stillman in the early, okay. uh, mid 1980s. I uh, came back home, did my graduate work at uh, the Ohio State University. Yes, sir. And I got a job uh, at the University of Mississippi in 1995. I've been down here ever since. Uh, okay. So it's been quite an experience. Okay, I'm gonna go back on your parents, man. How did they go to college, man? Did your did your great grandfather? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's a you know that's story. a that's a heck of a question. Um, my father was an outstanding basketball player at a high school called Winona, right there in Birmingham, and uh, Stillman was starting a basketball team in 1951. The coach that had just been hired came to Birmingham looking for players. And really he was going to another high school. He went to uh, Parker High School, which is a huge, strong uh, black high school there in, in Birmingham. And he went over to Parker. And while he was at Parker, they said, hey man, we just played the city championship. There was a cat over there. We know to score like 20 something points, man, he is good. So he went to Winona and he offered my father a scholarship and uh, that's how my father got to Stillman. Okay. My mother, um, growing up in Aliceville, was very, very, very smart. Uh, and when she was in high school, her story was that the teacher went around the room and asked every kid, where are you going to college? And everybody was saying Tuskegee or Alabama State or Annie M. And it got to her uh, roof, where are you going? And she just dropped her head and said, my family ain't got no money. I, I don't think I won't be able to go to college. I can't go. We can't afford it. The teacher went and called some people, really some white uh, individuals that were connected with Stillman. Stillman was a Presbyterian uh, school, uh, and they actually gave her a scholarship. And that's how she got to college. And okay, so um, my father had a real interesting philosophy with us. He said he never would have been able to get to school. Uh, had he been absent. And so he had a no-nonsense policy. You had to be almost dead to not go to school. And none of this playing hooky, none of this, you kind of sick. It. He felt like that changed his life, and he was absolutely right. After he yeah, got out of Stillman, he uh, actually um, did a master's degree in social work at the University of Chicago, oh. and then was a professor at Ohio State. My mother. Um, went to Stillman, got out of Stillman, eventually went to law school, oh, uh, became a lawyer. And so my father was a professor, my mother was a lawyer, and they were I very strong it. about education. 
Now, Absolutely. okay, let's go back a little bit further. If you know that, what about your grandparents? Did they do the college thing or <laughs> go that far back? Now, that's interesting. I just did a talk at my school about my family. Um, so my grandfather, who I never met, only had about third grade education. He was born in Utah, Alabama, and it's spelled E-U-T-A-W. Um, sharecroppers. Oh, really? uh, he was born... Um, right like in, in the late 18 like 89 okay his father who I, I went on uh, and i did yeah. this whole dna thing uh uh through ancestry.com his father was was a former slave was born right at when slavery was ending yeah um they settled in utah they had land and so i think my grandfather who i never met his name was charlie ross uh, he left Utah and migrated to Birmingham and worked in the steel mills and stuff like a lot of African-Americans were doing. But he was a very interesting individual in that he had the foresight to start. Uh, and I heard all these stories from my father and his younger brother, uh, my uncle, a cleaners. Oh, and that's his, yeah, so it's interesting. The cleaners was basically on the back of their house and he had a press. And it gave him a certain amount of autonomy where now they were insulated from white people to where they had probably a little bit more pride and a little bit more kind of uh, economic control over themselves. Yes. Where they weren't working in the steel mill or working for a job. Uh, my grandmother never worked. Um, she was in the house and she, she was very insulated. She wasn't a domestic where she had to go and work in a, in yeah, a white there was person's house. a lot of house. that going on. Yes. And so uh, my grandfather had his cleaners. Black people brought their clothes. And then one of the first jobs my father had was they had a bicycle with a basket on the front of it. And he went around, delivered the clothes and picked up clothes. Um, and so they had a little more kind of control yes. over their lives because they yes. did not have any kind of agricultural job or any kind of job in a meal or, you know, the mother in a, dom in a domestic capacity. Uh, and so I um, heard all these stories about Charlie Ross. He, yeah. I, I was born in 1964, and he died in 1961, uh, three years before I was yes. born. Now, now, let me ask you this. Uh, as a result, uh, being in Birmingham, did, did they tell you some racial stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Some I mean, they told me Connor stories stuff that, and all that kind oh, of my stuff. God. They, yeah, I mean, the story about Bull Connor is very interesting. Um, so baseball was very important. My father played baseball and the Negro leagues were just powerful. They were, they were in the apex during this time. And the Negro leagues were more than simply um, sport and wins and losses. Uh, my father, the way he tells the story is that you went to church, you were hoping on that Sunday, the minister didn't have no long winded sermon. If the Birmingham, Birmingham Black Bears were playing uh, that Sunday. And soon as he got finished, you went down to Rickwood Ballpark uh, where the Barons played, and you you wore your suit. Women wore their dresses and hats, and people were selling ice cream, and they had rides in the festival, and it was a just very black, yes, strong, yes. prideful kind of activity. Right. Uh, and Bo Connor was an announcer for the white uh barons in Birmingham and people got to know him because he called the ball games and on one day out of the week they would let black people go to the white games and when you went to the white games you could only sit in one little section out like in left field and all these black people would be concentrated in this one little area and Bull Connor got to be kind of famous because he called the games and he had one of these famous sayings where if a white player for the Barons hit one over there where the black folk were sitting, he would say, oh, he just hit one over in the cold bin. In the, in the so, way? In the cold bin. Oh, like, man. you know, like where you keep cold, like where all these black I folk I got you, sitting. I got you. I see what and he was so saying. so he became a, 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 a local kind of personality then he ran for mayor and he actually became mayor and safety director. And so, you know, when King came to Birmingham in 1963, um, you know, Bull Connor had a 
strong reputation of no nonsense. Um, that yeah. the, the police force was was very you know racist. Um, they would really mistreat you. Um, there's a story where my uncle, uh, who told us probably more stories and was more honest about this kind of stuff than my father, he would go to a whole nother level. My uncle was really kind of a street cat. And he said they were playing dice one day. And the guy that was a sheriff pulled up, probably 10 or 15, you know, cats, teenagers. And uh, he started rounding people up, putting them in the back of the police car, just putting them one, three, four, and they just stacked up in there. And so he got to one kid and he said, hey, man, get in that car. He said, sir, I don't know, ain't nowhere to sit. Can I sit up there in the front with you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I can't say exactly what this white man said to him, but he used the N-word and kicked this guy in the back of his pants and said, man, if you don't get your, you know yeah, what, up yeah, in this yeah. dang on car. And so it was that kind of thing that they really, they, they really experienced all of these kind of things. But what's interesting, they had a real interesting kind of take on segregation. Yeah. They act like they weren't really bothered by it. They had their own church. They had their own schools. They had their own baseball teams. Yeah. They had their own grocery stores. They had black principals. They had black leaders. And so in a certain sense, they weren't necessarily that impressed. Now, they could not vote. When you went to Birmingham and you had to try to buy some kind of item, you couldn't try on a hat. Yeah, you right. You move to the back right. of the bus. Um, my father said his first real kind of test of segregation, he went to the store and he just couldn't take it no more. He ran up to the white only drinking fountain and he drank some water. He looked at his mom and said, Mama, the water ain't no, don't taste no different. She said, come on here, boy. Don't you be fooling around with that kind of stuff. She didn't go into the complexities of it. Yeah, right. But basically, they felt like, you know, just because those white people were doing their own thing, they're playing basketball at the University of Alabama and all this, they felt like they had their, you know, they seeing, you know, Willie Mays. They got all yes. these great players. Uh, the Birmingham Bears are coming through. They got everybody got their own house. Fathers are present in the home. Very few, few people didn't have a father at home. Yes. Uh, black men making a ton of money at steel mill in the coal mines in Birmingham. Everybody buys a new car every year. So for them, their whole thing was, we ain't really trying to do with these white people. I mean, we ain't I really love complaining. It. I agree. You know, we got a certain amount of pride and uh, dignity uh, and they felt like, in a certain sense, African Americans kind of lost that uh, when they started integrating. Because yeah. what happened is, no more black principals, no more black teachers, no more black kind of pride messages in school about what you can do, what you can be. Okay, let me ask you this then. Go to. Let me ask. Uh, since you said that, hold on. Let me I interrupt you. Since you said that, why did they want integration? Why do you think they wanted it? Well, I think Dr. King and others felt like. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it just boils down to you pay taxes. There you go. That's what I got. Okay. You pay taxes. Right. Okay. The federal government takes your money. The state of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, South Carolina, they take your money. Uh, and so why is it that you have to walk five miles past the white school with better books, better desk, cleaner uh, nice gym, yes. all of these kind of amenities yes. to go to a black school where they're not giving you the same thing. Now, their argument almost was, well, if you're going to actually implement separate but equal, like the Supreme Court said in 1896, if you're actually going to implement it where you give us the same resources. Yeah, that that's given, right. That's right. Okay, but the reality is that was simply philosophical. Yes. It, it never happened in terms yes. of literal. It was simply something where Black people got less resources. They're paying the same kind of taxes. And so that was what the argument was, yes. I would say, you know, because it starts with the Brown decision. The Brown decision really facilitates all of this. And uh, the Brown decision is, is grounded in the idea that this little girl uh, has got to walk past, in Kansas, got to walk past a white school to go to a black school 
and uh, the black school doesn't have the same kind of resources. Yeah, yeah, no, it's no question. I, I agree. I think the tax thing was the big, the big, uh, the yes. big, the big piece to it. And so now, as we move up the timeline, um, and you and you alluded to this in terms of the sports. I had a guy on the channel. He said, "Man, them black players, them games was big at the baseball. I mean, and, and I mean, it was packed. It was a whole lot going on." Uh, I, I think he even said that there were times that the black teams played the white teams. Negro leagues won two thirds of the games they played against white teams when they played. And, you know, to drive the point home even further, um, my father was adamant when he got to Stillman and they traveled around. But he was on a basketball team. He's on a, bas he's on a basketball team, but okay. I mean, to, to, to just drive this point home. Yes in terms of the level of competition. You know, he said, when you start, you go in, when you go to Tuskegee, go to Alabama State, go to Alabama a and &M, go to Jackson State, you play Texas Southern, you have teams where the best African-Americans, okay? Because there are fewer black schools then there are African Americans in the population, probably in relationship to white people and the opportunities they're having to go to college. Right. Their whole mindset was: listen, the to be able to make a team, whether it's baseball, basketball, or football, particularly a, a college team to get a scholarship, you had to be able to bring it. And so, you know, he was saying we were. You know, here we were shooting jump shots, you know, knowing how to dribble and doing this and watching uh, white guys at the University of Alabama shooting chest shots, still shooting underhanded free throw. Yeah. He said, man, we would have beat the University of Alabama by 30 points. He said, there's no way that that level of competition was at the same level of these black schools. And uh, a strong argument can be made because uh, once – segregation began to kind of come under assault. Uh, a lot of these white coaches, uh, Bear Bryant, Coach Vault here, and other individuals that coach, whether it be basketball, football, whatever the case may be, they were very, very reluctant to, to play black teams. And of course, the argument was, well, the state has this law that you can't play integrated teams. But I think they knew deep down inside that, hey, you play a black team and you get destroyed. What does that say? It's yeah, bigger than simply you. sports. It's bigger you. than sports. It's saying now that black people should be able to vote, should be able to be a representative yeah, in, the, in Congress, should be able to represent you in the legislature, should yeah. be able to be your mayor, yeah. that they have the same qualifications. Yeah. In fact, they may be even smarter, more better athletes, yes. whatever the case may be. Yes, I love it. Now, yeah. uh, I, I, oh man, you hitting it out the box now. How about this? So your your specialty is football. Yes. What was what's the history of blacks in football starting in college and then going to the pros? Was there was there a Negro League football league at one point? Yes. Yes. Never a lot of people that. don't. A lot of a lot of people don't. But if you read my book Outside the Lines, uh, published by NYU Press, you'll you'll be able to to because I have a chapter. Uh, that looks at that. It's very interesting in that um, football, particularly pro football, uh, allowed black players to play um, in the early 20th century. The first African, a lot of people don't know this, the first African-American pro football player that we can document that was compensated was a man named Charles Follis, who played up in Ohio, in Shelby, Ohio, from 1904 to 1906. And uh, he was, football was very, very different. Um, a lot of people died because people got kicked in the head. People got punched. People got kicked simply because you were tackled on the ground. People might elbow you, do all kinds of things, um, to just to abuse you. And so he had a lot of physical abuse. He only played for two years. And so from night from 1906 till 1933, there are about 13 to 14 African Americans that play pro football. Uh, is this the is, NFL or is this some other kind of league? It, this is this is basically initially the NFL was called the American Professional Football Association. It was started in 1920. 
1922, it changes its name to the NFL. And so from 1922 to 1933, the NFL has a lot of teams in a lot of you know, areas in the Midwest, small towns. They're really struggling to get fans, to get stability. But by 1933, they've, they've kind of established that. And there are about, there are three major owners that are involved in the establishment of the unwritten color barrier in pro football. Okay. The architect of that was a man named George Preston Marshall who ran the Washington Redskins. He was adamant that he would not play black players. The other individuals that were involved were Art Rooney of Pittsburgh Pirates, really Pittsburgh Steelers, right. uh, Wellington Mara, who ran the Giants, and one other individual, of course, George Hallis, who was really the founder of pro football. All these individuals. So Hallis, Mara, and Rooney kind of went along with Marshall. There's an indication that in 1933, when the NFL was reorganized, and they have a championship game and it's become a lot more popular and stable. Marshall says, hey, we don't need to keep letting these black players have this opportunity. So from 33 to 46, there are no black players that play in the NFL. Now, you won't find in the NFL minutes at the Pro Football Hall of Fame and their library and their archives are going through all of that. Everybody, the number of historians have looked at this. Yes. It seems to be just simply an oral agreement among these owners. And we know this because there are some phenomenal players that come out of college. Uh, Kenny Washington comes out of UCLA in 1939. They don't, they don't, they don't draft him. Jackie Robinson averaged 12 yards a carry at UCLA as a senior in 1941. They don't draft him. That's the baseball player, Jackie Robinson. Listen, Jackie Robinson's weakest sport was baseball. Really? Okay. Absolutely. He probably pound for pound was one of the best college football players in the, in the early 1940s. He lettered in UCLA in football. He led the Pac-10 in scoring in basketball. He ran track and he played baseball. He only hit about 280 and 290 at UCLA. Jackie Robinson went on the record and said Kenny Washington, who actually played for UCLA, as the left halfback and did a lot of the passing, Kenny Washington hit about 400 at UCLA playing baseball. Jackie Robinson said Kenny Washington was a way better play baseball player than he. Really? Jackie Robinson is given the opportunity to integrate because of a couple of factors. Yeah. Played at UCLA and already played with white players. He'd been in the military. He was married. Okay? So he wasn't a drinker or a carouser. There were a ton of players in the Negro Leagues. Josh Gibson. Yeah. Uh, Satchel Page. Right, right. Buck Leonard. I mean, all kind of people that right. Branch Ricky could have pulled on and decided to use for this experiment. But uh, Jackie Robinson was kind of perfect in that he was clean cut. He knew he had education. And Ricky needed someone that would understand the complexities of what he wanted, okay? That you got to be able to stomach this abuse. You got to be articulate. You got to be intellectual. You can't lose your cool. And after three years, I'm going to turn you loose. But he had to find the right person. He couldn't have I someone that failed. And, and it, now it, it arguably maybe killed Jackie Robinson in terms of his high blood pressure, and diabetes, and all this oh, stuff. Oh, is that right? All that stuff took a toll on him at the end of his life. And I think a lot of that was because that was against his natural personality. I mean, growing up in high school, he fought all the time. Anytime a white person said something derogatory, he challenged that. Um, when he was in the military, he got kicked off a bus because he got on the bus. And in the South, a lot of people don't understand, didn't realize this, but a lot of bus drivers wore guns like a pistol. They felt like they was almost like the police. Like they could just do it and say anything they wanted to the really? black people. So he got on the bus at a, at a, at a, at a camp in Kansas. Bus driver said, hey, man, move on to the back of the bus. He said, hey, man, I'm moving. You ain't got to talk to me like that. He said, hey, what's wrong with you? 
they went at it. Jack Robinson was arrested. He told the army, hey man, you know, I hadn't done anything. So they gave him an honorable discharge. He played with the Negro Leagues before he got an opportunity to play with, with Brooklyn. And when he was playing with the Negro Leagues, a lot of players were really worried. They, they didn't want to, they didn't never send him in to talk to white people about food or anything like that. Because he was always adamant, hey man, if we can't sit here and eat, don't buy no gasoline from these folks. I'm not it. drinking out no water holes, you know, because they don't want to give us a, 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 some water. And so he really pushed the envelope and he really, the Negro Leagues were really tough for him because he felt like I'm an American, I have certain rights, and I don't think that I don't need to accept this. And a lot of the, the brothers that were playing the Negro Leagues, like, hey man, you know, I got a family. I'm trying to make money, man. You know, I don't, I, I can't be up here. You know, this, yeah, this is bigger. This is, what, this is what life has always been like in America. I got you. I'm just going to accept that. Then I want to go back to this question uh, again, though. Was there a Negro League football? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so yeah, no, yes. no, you're good though. Uh, no, no, you're listen, good. Um, when the color barrier comes down from 33 to 46, there are a number of black players from Kenny Washington, even uh, Jackie Robinson, a whole lot of outstanding players that are coming out of college. Uh, and interestingly enough, Prince Pollard, who played in the early uh, 1920s, puts together a team called the Brown Bombers, named after Joe Lewis. They played out of Harlem. They, they played a lot of semi-pro teams. Oh, really? Uh, there, were, there were a number of teams. There was a black team over in Knoxville, Tennessee, another black team out of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and so uh, there were a number of, of black uh, players. It was an outstanding player named Joe Lillard, who played at Oregon, who played with the Cardinals uh, in 1932. Uh, and unlike Robinson, got into a lot of fights on the field while he was in the NFL. They released him at, and, and going into after the 1933 season. Yeah. He got his own team. And so there were all these teams that, um, you know, that really were put together that uh, were teams that were based out of kind of local lo locations that you. were Negro League teams because, hey, the Negro Leagues were booming in baseball, and they saw that in a lot of African Americans. But did they have a name for the league, league or something? Uh, it, never wasn't, really it wasn't that formally like organized. That. It wasn't the league, but it was just these individual teams that played. Uh, a lot of them played kind of over in the Northeast, uh, the Brown Bombers out of, out of New York, okay. uh, Chicago, uh, and then some other teams uh, okay. in the Midwest. Let me ask you this: uh, you, 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 you. I'm going back on the discussion just a tad because you got me going, man. You said something about night, the first guy in 1904. Yes, but what did uh, he play Charles, at? He played for he a got team. Paid for to play. Well, his name his name was Charles Follis, and he played for a team called the Shelby Blues in Shelby, Ohio, which is in northeastern Ohio. It's right over there, kind of by like. Uh, Canton, Mansfield, all of that area back up in there, real you. blue collar area. Um, and, uh, you know, he was a halfback. Uh, and he, again, got this opportunity uh, because it was a, a, a white man who had this team. Uh, he needed somebody at halfback that was outstanding. Fallas had uh, played at Ohio uh, Wesleyan. I'm sorry, at, uh, at Wooster College. He played at Wooster College up there in Northeast Ohio. And uh, people knew him, knew he was a great college player. Uh, and so he gave him this opportunity to play and he played yeah, for two you. years, um, just had a lot of shoulder problems because yeah, got his shoulder dislocated. Uh, and again, uh, you know, we're not talking about face masks. You cannot come out the game unless you hurt. You play both ways in football during this time period. A lot of physical abuse in terms of people kicking, biting, punching, stepping on you. Uh, and so after two years, uh, he just gave it up. It okay. Let me ask you this. Who was the first black NFL player? I'm not trying to stump you with this. Who uh, made the Hall of Fame? Uh, the first African-American to be inducted into uh, the Hall of Fame uh, was uh, Mary Molly Bill Willis, who played uh, at uh, Ohio State. I'm sorry. Bill Willis played at Ohio State. Mary Motley played at um, uh, University of Nevada. Uh, they played together on the Cleveland Browns. 
I'm sorry. So Bill Willis actually was inducted first. Bill Willis is from Columbus, Ohio. He played on the on the on the on the on the on the defense and offensive line. Really, he was an outstanding defensive lineman. Uh, in 1946, uh, Paul Brown, who at this time was the coach of a military team after World War II is coming to an end. Paul Brown had coached at Ohio State in 1944. The idea was that after the war, after World War II ends, Paul Brown's going to come back to Ohio State. Well, they decided to organize a rival league to the NFL called the All-American Football Conference. The team that was in Cleveland, the Cleveland Rams, the owner of the Rams decided that I can't make things go in Cleveland. I can't get enough fans. I'm not making enough money. And so with, air, with the airlines now being able to be commercialized, the Rams were the first team to move to the West Coast. He moves the Cleveland Rams to L.A. and they become the L.A. Rams. So Cleveland doesn't have a pro really? football team anymore. Yes. So they start this new league called All-American Football Conference. And they reach out to Paul Brown and say, hey, we want a team in Cleveland. We want you to coach it. You can have 5% of the team. He thinks about it. He thinks about it. He starts thinking about the money. He tells Ohio State, I ain't coming back. There's a real friction. The Ohio State real guy still has kind of beef with Paul Brown not coming back because they spent, they thought that he was going to, they had made this promise. He had made this promise. He's going to come back. Right. So he coaches the Cleveland Browns in 1946. Bill Willis had played at Ohio State under Paul Brown. Okay. So Paul Brown. Uh, decides that, okay, I know there are no black players in the NFL. I don't care about that. I want the best players I can get my hands on. I love it. I I knew I heard his name in this regard. So he basically reaches out to Bill Willis. He says, hey, I want you just to show up in camp this summer. I ain't telling nobody nothing. You just show up. When he shows up, he tells him, hey, go get your uniform. Goes out and gets the uniforms. All the white players are like, what's the deal? You know, they kind of like, they yeah. they, they, they shocked about how yeah. this is ready to go down. Sure. So Paul Brown, he tells him, come on, we're ready to go through uh, practice. I want you to line up over the center. And the center couldn't block him. He's so fast, so quick. Uh, they try to use the running back to kind of come off the, off the center. Right. He packs him every time. The white players like, damn. Okay. So, he puts Bill Willis on the team. And so he needs a roommate. Okay, because when you go on the road, he can't, you know, can't. Yeah. Paul Brown had coached Marion Motley, who was from Kent. Marion Motley was maybe pound for pound the greatest fullback to ever play in the NFL. If you've ever seen um, any kind of footage on Earl Campbell. Yeah. Okay, Earl Campbell ran towards contact. Right. Well, Campbell never hardly ran out of bounds, okay? That's how Mary Miley ran. He ran, he initiated contact, he knocked people over. He was a devastating fullback. So once Will Willis was on the team, he brought in Mary and Miley, and the two of them were roommates, um, and they made the Browns in 1946. And so when when, uh, Bill Willis finally retires from the Browns, He's the first African American to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and then uh, uh, Mary Motley is second yeah, a year yeah. or so behind uh, behind Bill Willis. I love it. Okay, I got a few more yeah. for you, my man. You know, you 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 own it. How about this one? Was it, it, it when did they start allowing blacks to come to the games, to the NFL games, to be spectators? Well, you could you could go to games. I mean, you had certain kind of places you could sit in certain with with, with, with certain teams. Okay, but even, the, even before that, that, there were black players, you could go. Yeah, yeah, you could go to a game. I mean, there were going to be certain like like well, you know, depending upon the location, um, certain places, particularly in the South, uh, they might have a very 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 small black section, and that actually. Uh, Play to the detriment of, of, of some teams. For example, like in 1952, the NFL decides to expand and they create uh, the Dallas Texans down in Dallas. They have a out, they have a couple of outstanding back, they have an outstanding black player 
George Talaferro and another one named Buddy Young. They played the fairgrounds. Black people could go to the game, but they were again in a section that was roped off behind the uprights in the end zone. Uh, and so, you know, that's a very interesting point because Paul Brown, the Browns are very successful in the All-American Football Conference in 1946. And a lot of that success is Black people had migrated to Cleveland. There were no Black players on the Rams, on, on, the, on the Cleveland Rams. But the Browns now have these two Black players. They're drawing. So the Rams may, may have been able to draw 20, 25,000 at, at best. First game of the season, the Browns draw like 70,000 people. And a number of those folk are African-American. And so in a lot of ways, what Brown begins to do and other teams that begin to bring on these Black players, they begin to kind of recognize that there's money in Black people coming to the games. Oh, Listen, yeah. Brooklyn, the, look, the Brooklyn Dodgers were sitting there in that borough struggling with the Yankees and the Giants. They and Black people came to the games but came in very, very, very small numbers. But you best believe once Jackie Robinson took that field in April 15th of 1947, black folk got on trains, cabs, got with walk, whatever they did, and they began to come to those games. And so I got you. the Dodgers now began to increase their attendance. Got to give Branch Ricky credit for having the ability because nobody else decided to do this, but also he was a businessman now. And so he understands that, yeah, I got you know, you. hey, Black people are not patronizing white baseball. And so his numbers begin to pick up, and immediately the Dodgers actually begin to improve on the field because they bring on Campanella and other uh, 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 African-American players. They begin to now finally compete in the National League, get to the World Series, uh, and eventually finally break through and beat the Yankees in 1955. So let, let, let me ask you this. question. Is there an incident on a football field, let's say, I'm going to stick with that, where there's protest of black players? Um, uh, are there fights in the stands between the white spectators and the black spectators? Any, any racial incidences <laughs> that come to mind? Well, nothing necessarily that, that, that large that would, would be significant to where, you know, I'm sure they were, were, were back and forth between black and white fans. But let me say this. Uh, my second book that looks at African Americans in the American Football League. And by the 1960s, because of this whole civil rights thing and, 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 and everyone now understanding protests, uh, Black players in the American Football League um, decide that uh, the AFL, um, by 1965, has gotten stabilized. They got a number of teams. And they did decide that they're going to have an all-star game after the championship game. And they want to expand. And they want to expand in the South. And so they have a, 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 a real trial balloon. They say, okay, we're going to have our all-star game in New Orleans. So you've got a number of Black players that are all-stars. They get to New Orleans. They, get to, they, get, they, get, they come out of the airport. White cab drivers don't want to pick them up. They have to get Black cabs. They get to the hotel. Uh, they say, hey, man, we're going down to French Quarter, man. We're going to go party. We're going to have a good time. Get down to French Quarter. They can't go into any of these kind of restaurants or clubs. In fact, Earl Faison, who was an outstanding defensive lineman, like 6'4", about, at this time, about 250, which was big. He was solid. He tries to go in the club, and a white man pulled a pistol, put it right in his face, and says, hey, you're not coming in this club. I don't care who y'all are, what y'all are doing, who y'all play for. You're not coming in this club. So they get pissed off. They all go back at that night. And they meet back up at the hotel. And Cookie Gilchrist, who was the outstanding running back for the Buffalo Bills, a lot of people compared him to, to Jim Brown. He had a lot of attitude, a lot of pride. Uh, he was married to a white lady. But uh, you couldn't <laughs> tell him anything. He did anything. I mean, he was really hard to deal with. He called a meeting. He said, hey, man, we're going to take a vote. I want y'all to decide. I don't want to play this game in New Orleans, okay? Uh, folk around here protesting all across America, Black folk, we're not getting treated right. 
we ain't finna play this game. And he said, I'll kick anybody's ass that votes that we want to stay. So they vote to not go. They don't go to practice the next, next day. Jack Kemp, longtime Republican politician who's quarterback for Buffalo, and a couple of other white players, they get off the bus and they start looking around and say, something wrong. Everybody ain't here. And the guy said, hey, man, the black players, they didn't, they didn't protest. They didn't say they're not going to show up. Right. Jack Kim goes over to the hotel, try to talk to him. Couldn't get Chris said, hey, man, listen, if we go ahead and play this game, we basically are proving what's going on right down here in, in, in New Orleans. I love it. And we're not helping these black folks. We're not playing. They actually don't play the game. They force the AFL to move the game from New Orleans to Houston. They play the game in Houston. All these reporters cover everything. And eventually, two years later, New Orleans gets the Saints. But they only get the Saints when the city of New Orleans changes its overall segregation policy in terms I of clubs and everything. I love it. And so a lot of people don't know about that story. Yes. But these guys went out on the limb and told these owners, we ain't playing, man. Okay, y'all move this game. And eventually... When the Saints tried to be created, uh, Roselle, when he is basically trying to get everything approved through Congress, New Orleans has to change that policy for them to now get the New Orleans Saints. So the only reason they got the New Orleans Saints is largely because of this protest about these black players that took yes, place in I the AFL. Yes, I love it. What yeah. a story. You know, and that's the one thing that I, I guess you can conclude out of that is that when we do stand up and protest, things do happen. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. I, I give you an example, and then this is off the line and, you know, kind of coming to a close and, you know, different topic. But I talked, I got a guy on the channel who was out of Birmingham who said Birmingham was up for a baseball team. But uh, the I guess Bull Connor said, hey, I can't have no blacks and whites playing. So you know what they did? They moved the team to Atlanta and Birmingham as a city as a whole never grew uh, to that extent. Things like that held them back, uh, those racist attitudes. Absolutely. And, um, you know, that's interesting because, uh, you know, at that time, probably Birmingham and Atlanta were probably comparable in terms of, you know, maybe population, yeah. opportunity, land, expansion. Uh, and can you imagine, you know, when you think of Atlanta today and you go to Atlanta, I mean, Atlanta is an entirely different place than when it was when the Braves met there, probably in the mid 1960s, 66, 67. Yes. Uh, Atlanta got all these suburbs. Uh, once once, once uh, the Braves moved there, then you get the Falcons, uh, you get the Hawks. Yep. Uh, and so it has become this kind of internet. You get a major airport. Yes. Uh, it's a major now That's city right. in America. That's right. Birmingham looks at that and it allows segregation to prevent it. That's or right. Maybe reaching that's, those kind of heights. That's, uh, that's right. There's no telling what Birmingham would be like. That's right. Uh, had it not yeah, that's uh, right. been so entrenched and committed to segregation. That's right. Let me, let, let, uh, just a couple uh, quick questions. Um, who's the black, uh, the first black uh, head coach? In pro football? Yes, pro football. All these are pro footballs. Well, the head, first head coach was actually Fritz Pollard. Who coached the Akron Pros in nineteen in nineteen twenty? The first African American head coach in what's called the modern era. In terms of once you now have the NFL formally organized yes. and you yes. have leagues and it's Art Shell of the Raiders. Okay, who's the Art first? Art Shell out of uh, out of uh, Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, historically black school, outstanding offensive lineman, played with yeah. the Raiders for years. First, yeah. first African American head coach in the modern era. Who who is the uh, first black quarterback? Because they held they held black guys away from that position for the longest. Now that's a great question. Could that there's be a, a lot of debate. A, a there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a there's a lot of debate around that. There is uh, evidence that Kenny Washington, for example, threw threw a pass for the Los Angeles Rams. He will get this opportunity to play for the Rams in 1946. Finally, um, as a left halfback, he'll go into a game. Uh, and replace the starting uh, quarterback of the Rams, Bob Waterfield, and throw throw a couple of passes. 
Um, the first African American to start a game as a quarterback was Marlon Briscoe. I remember that name. Denver Broncos, yeah. AFL 1968. Yeah, I remember that name. Outstanding player at the yeah. University of Omaha, played quarterback. And, um, you know, they, they had some injuries uh, in training camp when they uh, were getting ready to start the season. So they had they didn't really have any choice. Yeah. Lou Saban had to start Marlon Briscoe. And one of the real good things about that, you know, it was, it was, it was tough because people wrote letters and all this kind of stuff. But he said that, you know, and one of the things I like about Joe Namath is that Joe Namath, uh, as a white player, uh, did not just turn the other cheek and not try to acknowledge uh, that there are things that you can do as a white player in power to make African-American players, either your opponents or particularly players on your team, feel a lot more comfortable. Okay. And so Joe Namath, you know, he's from – Pennsylvania, but he went to Alabama. But when he got on the Jets, one of the first things he did a lot of times was black players be sitting at one table, white players at another table. He go sit with the black player. Oh, really? Uh, he get on the bus, black players on one on one section, white players in another. He go sit with the brothers. He, you know, rising. He did all this, all this stuff. I got you. And when he was playing in the AFL, Briscoe got an opportunity to play. He said that from the time he met Briscoe, every time he meets Briscoe, from that point, since they, they was playing, Briscoe went to a different position and played receiver and had all his accolades. Sure. And even when they retired, he says, Briscoe said the first thing he says whenever he meets, there goes the quarterback. There goes the quarterback. In essence, Namath is basically acknowledging you should have been a legitimate quarterback, but right. because of all this racism, you never really got this opportunity. But I'm going to acknowledge. Yeah, okay? I love it. And, and so, uh, really, really kind of, kind of, kind of. And Briscoe has really has been really touched yeah. by the fact that Namath uh, continues to actually do that. As we come to a close, is there a, you, uh, is there a question that I have not asked you? Is there a, that, you know, kind of burning on your mind? Is there, how do people find out about you, get your books, that kind of thing? Your website? Well, I'm at the University of Mississippi. They can Google me. Um, I've got a couple of books, Outside the Lines uh, and Money Mavericks and Men. It looks at, uh, Outside the Lines, it looks at African-Americans, basically in the NFL, and Money Mavericks and Men okay. looks at African-Americans in the, in the uh, AFL. Um, and I've been talking about a lot of things that's been happening in the world in terms of, whether it be from, from, from George Floyd and all of a sudden now America has decided, oh, we got a racial problem. Oh my God, we got to figure out how to kind of start dealing with this. And we need to talk about this and yes. we'll protest and, 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 you know, Black Lives Matter isn't necessarily this kind of right. white hatred kind of or, uh, organization. Um, but probably uh, the thing that I, I maybe would close with is um, this recent situation with John Gruden as a head coach of the Oakland Raiders um, and these emails that he sent out. And it's, you know, in, a, in, a, in some ways, he's just a representative figure of a larger kind of situation. I love it. Uh, because, you know, we've been pushing uh, for African-Americans to get opportunities, both in college and at, the, and at the pro level, to be head coaches, to be general managers, to be head coaches in college, the athletic directors, to be in these power positions, to be coordinators, right. offense, defense. And we keep getting all of this kind of rhetoric uh, and you keep getting bypassed. You keep getting individuals that are in a lot of ways, not really qualified. They're young, they're white, uh, they're male. Uh, and, and they just make these individuals comfortable in these decision-making positions that they're in. Right. And that's extremely problematic. We're almost at a point where it feels like um, the powers that be in this country have decided that, well, you know, black folk, y'all can just be the laborers. Y'all can be, 
when you look at it, when you watch uh, football this weekend, the majority of the people out there on this field that's making this money for these colleges are African-American males. Right. Uh, when you watch Sunday football on Sunday, the NFL is 70% black now. It's the biggest sport in America in terms of its revenue. And so it's almost like the powers that be have said, well, you know, hey, we can't compete with African-Americans on the field. Just let them have it. They're better athletes, work at it harder, and they spend more time at it. But they're not going to be the ones in the decision-making process. And so that's the next step in this fight is that, I got you. hey, you know, we got the same amount of intellect. Yeah, uh, we that's should right. have the same kind of opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop him there because we rolling. I'm going to have him back yes, on the channel. Watch. Yeah, got to come back on. Man, we, you know, I know he ain't <laughs> did all he got in his mind in this short period of time. I'm going to have him come on as often as he would like to. Because Absolutely. Because he, uh, he knocked it out the box, man. Yeah. I didn't know them things about Jackie Robinson. Yeah. I did Check not. it out. Look up Jackie. I knew you that Jack when they select the person to be that front one, that they, they think it through. Yes. See if you can handle all of the conditions. And, and, and I heard that because Rosa Parkers was not the first black woman to say, I ain't getting up on my seat. Oh, no, there were several other black women. Yeah, there were several But others. she was secretary, of the, had been secretary of the NAACP. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 yeah. And, 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 you know, like these other women, she was older. A solid person in the community. Yeah, right. Uh, they weren't no, going to be no backlash. What they right. say about hey, Rosa. That's what. Absolutely. That's, what, that's my point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, everybody, yeah. this is what I do with strong inspirations. I find these super brilliant people, these experts. He didn't even have to look for the notes. He man, he had it like that. I bring, I find them somehow, and I asked him to come on the channel, and here we are. Everybody, uh, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button on this video because I know he blew your mind. Didn't know all this stuff. Hit the notifications bell for when I put the videos up. You get notified. You get a ding. You get a shock or something that says, hey, the strongest racist is back at you once again. Uh, tell somebody about this channel. I'm up to, I got 580 something subscribers. I want 5,000 in the next three months. It's going to blow YouTube's mind that that many people hit the button, which ain't a lot of people, but that's what my goal is. Uh, read, watch my movie, read my book, or uh, read his books. Read it. Are they on Amazon? Yes, they are. Yeah, I'm gonna put them in the description. Read his books. Yeah. And and, and support this brother in that regard. Uh, and so I say to you, my friend, with all sincerity, with all sincerity, I want you to stay strong, stay safe. Stay on your grind. I love what you're doing, that you have followed through on the background that your ancestors provided for you to go to the highest height to finish that dissertation. And now you are passing along your knowledge, not just here on Strong, but through them students that you teach at Ole Miss. Yeah. I appreciate you doing it. Everybody, uh, this is what we do. I'll say bye-bye, we out.